So today, we're just going to have some fun. I'm Katherine Ambrose, and Empowered Senior is a 501c3 nonprofit where we're devoted to putting out good education. Then my family and the Empowered Senior team, we work together to help manage timelines and help people figure out their housing and quality of life situations and help get you connected to the kind of professionals that are in this room. Okay. So you see the yellow sheet there and you're not in grade school, so guess what? You can work together on the answers. So, <laughs> so and you can do it or not do it. We're not gonna grade you. Um, we just want to make you think today, and some things you already know, but maybe there'll be something that'll spark your attention and you might find yourself thinking about later. And if you think of something that's an aha for you today, we hope you'll share it because when you share with people in the room, it helps them. All right. August is make a will month. How about that? Could be all kinds of other things, but the only one I know about is it is make a will month. What percentage of Americans have a valid will? What were your guesses? A, five to 10 percent. B, 25 to 40 percent. Who thought probably about half the people were smart enough to get a will? We're a very educated country. Half the people, for sure, got, have a will. Yeah? How about 75% or more? Because everybody knows you're supposed to have a will. When you had a baby, everybody told you you needed a will, right? So you got one, right? And you've kept it updated Throughout every single year, you've updated it a hundred times, and you have your attorney in your phone on speed dial, right? All right, so what, what's our answers? A, B, C, how are you guys so smart? I think you've been coming for a while, or you Googled it. The answer is B. Only 25 to 40% of Americans maybe have a will. You guys can speak to that a little bit. But I saw one stat that said 67% of Americans do not have a will. So what, what say you, Jason Bach, attorney at law? Having a will is a good idea. And, you know, part of the reason is, is you know, a will is not made at the time you need it. And so it's oftentimes, hopefully, made well in advance of the time you need it. And so it's difficult to predict what your situation is going to look like at the time that will is needed. It could be needed 10 years from the time you make it, 20, 30. Um, uh, it'd be a good idea to update that will as your life changes, the things you own change, uh, the people who you want to bless with gifts after your death may change. Um, and so uh, oh, having that will in place is something that provides you a degree of certainty and control over the process. And if for nobody else, do it for the people you leave behind. Because situations in, when, in which there's not a will, sometimes things go fine. Um, sometimes there are not issues, and some people's circumstances are such, very simple, not a lot of assets, maybe one child they want to leave thanks to. There's some, you know, there's some uh, flexibility you may have, and there may be some will substitutes that can be used. Um, but having a will is the best way of assuring that you're going to reduce problems after your passing for your loved ones and family members, and also that where your property, where you want your property to go is going to go in the manner you, you'd like it to. Very good. I like that F word, flexibility. Because that really should be one of our pillars, positivity, adaptability, like flexibility, that's right in there. 
And um, the professionals that are in this community um, can really help you figure things out because without help, we just don't know what we don't know. Like, I wish I would have, I'm certain, had an extra pair of pants in the car today. <laughs> but I did not know that I would get cream blush on my pants. So things happen. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. People are living longer than ever before. What is true about centenarians? All of the above. Who wants to live to be 100? Awesome. That's some positivity. I like it. Who thinks they might live to be 100 even if they don't want to live to be 100? Why do people not want to live to be 100? Poor health. Poor health. They want good health. They want to enjoy it. Running out of money. We are so tired of the politics, we can't take it anymore. <laughs> Already lost. You start losing your friends. You lose your life partner. Just lot, lots of sad things happen the longer we're here. We've been around a while. The longer you're around, the more things that happen. So that positivity, adaptability, and resourcefulness are really important. Did you write down flexibility? F word equals flexibility. So you can remember it. All right. What is the Golden Girls' approach to senior living? B, making friends, because we are experiencing loss as we age, and so you want to continue to have social connections and make friends. You never know where you're going to meet your next best friend. That's fact. Some people have met in this room at Parrot Senior and got married. Yeah, yeah, that's a fact, I know, unexpected good things happen. All right, what should be the slogan of the downsize and declutter movement? Less clutter, more life, that's the correct answer. Now what I hear a lot is, I'm not worried about it. They're on the E. They're, I'm not worried about it. My sons are going to take care of it. I wonder if the sons will still be talking to each other if they take care of it. So if you have kids that get along, because some people don't have kids that don't get along. True or not true? And do you have siblings that you get along with? Do you have siblings that you don't get along with? Sometimes it came down to an estate that went awry. The caregiving situations that didn't go to everybody's satisfaction. So we have to plan. So especially you want to see less clutter, more life if you've been into the more stuff, more joy for a while, which has been a lot of us. Keep everything forever. That's a lot of us. Embrace chaos. Embrace clutter. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, we got to clean it up at some point because our sons and daughters are not going to want to do it. And some of us don't have sons and daughters available to do it. Jill, are you going to do it? You're on your own. <laughs> <laughs> I know the people to bring in, so I don't. <laughs> <laughs> and she's got stuff at our house, like two rooms full of stuff. I feel like I just got thrown under the bus here. Yeah. Well, see, we're bringing It just in keeps me bringing, coming back to you, uh -huh. Mama. Her house is beautiful and perfect. Because I keep a lot of junk here. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> now, do you all have any of that going on where you're storing the wedding dress and the prom dresses and the motorcycle and the collectible car and all kinds of stuff? It's at your house instead of your kids' house. So sometimes they don't see a need to come get it because you have plenty of space. Yes, you have plenty of space. You have plenty of room. 
and there's no looming deadline. <laughs> now see, if you downsize, you, ha you can say, you need to come get your stuff by a certain date. And then, now they're ready to make a decision. Don't, sometimes we wait till we have a deadline to make a decision for lack of focus. So we're trying to create focus by educating and scaring you with our information that we share. <laughs> We're trying to fake some focus. And um, so if you can fake some focus with your kids and come get them, get them to come get stuff, awesome. But sometimes they need a deadline. And then guess what they're going to do? They're going to go, you know what? I don't really need that. And you're like, well, why have I been keeping it for 22 years? <laughs> All right, what can untreated hearing loss lead to in, in seniors? Social isolation, that's correct. C, social isolation, communication difficulties, and increased risk of cognitive decline and even falls. How can falls be caused by not being able to hear well? Your ear balance. Okay, you go kerplunk because your hearing has gone kerplunk. And you might fall because your balance is off. Oh, and that's what happens to her. Okay. What else? What else? If you can't hear well, what might cause you to fall? Okay. You didn't hear the warning. Somebody was trying to tell you. How often do you try to tell somebody something? And maybe it's not even a warning about something, but they didn't hear you. And what do they say all together? Huh? 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 That gets annoying, doesn't it? So we're annoying people. I could have put that for one of the answers. <laughs> Mind your own business, okay. Um, so this was a tricky question. This question, what else causes people to fall if they don't hear well? Your brain is busy listening to something in your environment without you even knowing it. So you maybe have the TV on in the other room, and you don't think you're listening to it, it's just on. But guess what? Your brain is still trying to hear it. That causes faults. So, okay. It's very important to hear, because when you don't, it just makes your life harder and you're missing out on fun. Now, if you like D, reduce need for social interactions, I guess that could work. Because you could actually be here, but not really have to talk to anybody because you can't hear them. All right, so I encourage you to get your hearing checked. Cherie, our insurance expert, can hearing aids and hearing tests sometimes be part of their Medicare insurance coverage? Yes, it can. Um, there are two sides of Medicare and both of them cover different. One side can help cover the exam, but nothing else. The other side can help cover both. So it just depends on the plan that you're on. Okay, so this is why you want to have a real insurance person, not 1-800-STRANGERS going to answer, but somebody... No Medicare helpline. Please, no Medicare helpline. It's all over the TV. <laughs> you want a face. You want a face, okay? You want a face, somebody that knows you, somebody that you might run into on the ball field or the grocery store because they are going to take extra personal care to make sure you're signed up for the right stuff. And you can say, hey, I haven't been getting hearing aids because they're too expensive. Well, I don't really know how much they cost, but I think they're expensive, and so I'm just not getting them right now. Plus, it might make me look old. But I was just curious, would I have any coverage? And sometimes people find out they have a lot of coverage, and it's very surprising. So you want a local face, a local human being, that maybe comes to your house and talks to you about your insurance stuff. Does that make sense? Okay, don't do business with 1-800. Don't sign up for things on the internet. Get a real person with a license, because we know there's volunteers, but we are proponents of licensed professionals that really know what they're doing. Because sometimes volunteers, how long is the class that they take? I'm not sure how long the class is, but it's just a certification, whereas 
somebody that's licensed is actually held to a different standard and they are held by the state. So um, volunteers are great, but you just make sure you're picking somebody that's licensed when it's time mm -hmm. to make the decision. So if you're an empowered senior, I think volunteers are great for somebody else. You guys can use for free a non-volunteer that will really help you. Do they write you a check, Cherie? Who? People that call to see if they have hearing aid coverage. Do you no. charge them for answering I, the phone? I don't charge clients for anything whatsoever. Okay, moving on. Number six, what is aging in place? See, so that's staying in the home that you live in now or a different home that you might choose to move to elsewhere that's still maybe in the same community of Wichita or surrounding area. Aging in place could be living at Oxford Villa. Could you please stand, Oxford Villa? And thank you for being here. And supplementing as time goes on, supplementing your independent living where you are aging in place at Oxford Villa. Where else? Do we have any other senior living independent today? The Regent. Cheryl, please stand, and Maria. So we have East Side and West Side represented. We have Oxford Villa on the west, okay, and the Regent. Beautiful. You can age in place at either location, and then if you need help or someone you know needs help over time, you can supplement by having in-home care and home health services there, and you can age in place there unless you decide to do something different, which might be to move into Oxford Grand, Jamie, you want to stand? And so they're going to tell you a little bit more about the difference between those types of living situations. But aging in place doesn't mean the two-story home or the quad-level home that you raised your children in, or you thought it would just be fun to live in a two-story because you've always thought they were grand and awesome. Sometimes they're not so awesome when your knee or your back or something else is wrong, whether it's permanent or temporary. All right, how can technology and social media help seniors stay connected? Are seniors capable of learning and using technology? Yes. Duh. Duh. Do some seniors refuse to learn how to buy an iPhone, use an iPhone, have computers? Okay, so they're just hurting themselves because they're not going to have as much connectivity. I thought about putting technology is just a waste of time on here. Do you know people that think technology is just a waste of time? Yeah, it can be. It's just like if you like ice cream, you can like ice cream and eat ice cream, but if you eat it for all your meals, that might not be good. You have to have a little flexibility. All right, minimizing clutter and organizing your current home is called? Decluttering, that's when you just are cleaning up your house, thinning things out. Minimizing belongings for a move that you're making or to, if you're going to go across the country, whatever age you are, you might want to leave a lot of stuff here because it's very expensive to move things. So that's called downsizing. You can always buy more stuff. How can participating in group activities or clubs benefit us as we age? See, who picked A? It's a waste of time and energy, plus other people are annoying. <laughs> I know a lot of people that tell me, I just don't like people. Well, that's okay. You can live at the Regent or Oxford Villa and not like people. You can just walk to your apartment home and stay in there and not like them from inside your room, <laughs> your apartment. But I have a feeling that you might change your mind because they do all kinds of incredible stuff. So we want you to be sure to tell us about the kind of stuff that they do. So one time a daughter called for her mother in independent living, couldn't reach her, couldn't reach her, couldn't reach her, couldn't reach her, called in a panic to the leadership staff and they said, well, your mother got on a bus to go to the casino. <laughs> no, no, not my mother. She doesn't like people. She's not social. I'm pretty sure the daughter says, could you go check, please? <laughs> Found out her, her mother was out having fun. It's okay. It is allowed. 
All right, which of the following is a potential warning sign of elder abuse? And unexplained injuries or bruises. I forgot to say you can circle as many things as you want. Um, it's also maybe a strong preference for privacy, like you can't get a hold of them anymore. And um, so that can be kind of weird. And so will you guys kind of remember to talk to us about elder abuse? How does decluttering transform a living space? All of the above. So you need to create space so that for those times when you might need help with equipment or people that you have room to move around or that you don't fall over stacks of stuff because you haven't gotten rid of your stuff yet, you haven't minimized yet. So stuff can be dangerous. We want to have clear paths and hopefully no throw rugs as we age, anything that can trip. Um, what generation are downsizing today? Boomers and their parents. Okay, so boomers and the generation that's a little older. That's who's downsizing today. So if you're older than a boomer, just know the boomers are already downsizing. Okay, how can downsizing be compared to a self-care journey? It's actually all of those. And I like completing our own mature life task because if we bought all that stuff and we allowed all that stuff to be in our house, it really should be up to us to the best of our ability to do something with it and not dump it off on somebody else. So, and I also like C, increase independence. Did you know that for some people, I, I'd say for everybody, if they move, let's say, to the Regent or Oxford Villa, they're actually increasing their independence. Because 80% of seniors want to stay in their own home, and the reason why is they think that it's going to decrease their independence. But in reality, it frees them, because now there's transportation when they need it, and it just makes life way simpler. So at some point, a different living situation can increase your independence and your overall quality of life and measures of happiness. What estate sale items have held their value? Who thinks it's Pyrex? <laughs> Guess what? Pyrex, for real. Yeah, Pyrex, that might be valuable. Somebody might want it. Mid-century modern everything, that's a fact. So if you have anything that looks like it might have been on the Dick Van Dyke show, <laughs> hang on to it. What about 1980s pop culture items? Yeah, because who's buying stuff? The people that grew up maybe in the 80s. People are always buying stuff. But the people in the 80s, they're nostalgic for the original Nintendo machine that they had and maybe Nintendo magazines and all kinds of stuff that they grew up with. How about the crystal and the china that you registered for for your wedding or that you inherited? Not worth anything. I like to use beautiful glassware instead of paper cups. Why not? If they break, you can go on the internet and find more. Or you can go to the estate sale and find more. You just sweep it up, okay, because that's what it's worth. What about antique furniture? Not worth anything. They want to paint it. In fact, Julian just asked for a dresser. Where are you? Oh, she, she's hiding. Okay, she's, she's out for a second. Okay, so we're going to talk about her while she's gone. She needs a dresser, and she doesn't want to spend any money on it. So she said, how about that old dresser that my brother used to have? I said, well, actually, that was great grandma's dresser. Was that thing beautiful? Oh! <laughs> no, don't pick it. No. <laughs> What's wrong with us? We're sick. Jillian, you can't have the dresser because Aunt Carolyn takes it. You cannot paint that dresser. No. Okay, so this is a sickness that we have. We're so attached to everything. It makes sense why we're attached to the dresser, right? But 
all our stuff that we have, we're so attached to it because it represents love, people that we love, memories, a good idea that we had one time, and we still might do it, maybe. <laughs> and so it's really hard to let go of stuff. Barbies and Pokemon cards, I called an estate sale expert. They said, yep, they might be worth something. But Hummel's Precious Moments and Longenberger, that's not worth anything, right? They said, well, you'd be surprised with how well we've done on some Hummels. And I've seen them sell a lot at Longenberger baskets for us, but they say that the thing is, is that it was marketing that got us to buy these things. This is a limited edition, must buy now. And $100 baskets might be selling for $25. And in Matt Paxton's book, Keep the Memories, Lose the Stuff, he says that our stuff is probably only worth 10% of what we think it's worth. So now when I go to a store and I think about buying something that I really don't need, I think, okay, once I walk out, it might be worth 10% what I just paid. So that's something to think about. So, but really the best answer is seven, it depends, okay? Because it depends on what the market will bear. And so you talk to estate sell people, personal property appraisers, they will tell you what they think. But the thing is, is not to be so emotionally attached to how much you think something is worth because it can hold back your quality of life and it can cause a lot of fights at estate sale time or estate planning, estate closing out, whatever. We'll have you guys tell us the right words. All right, 10,000 people a day turn 65 every day in this country. That is the silver tsunami that's happening right now. And um, so you're all competing with 300,000 people every year that are moving into assisted living you're competing for the most desirable apartments because there's a waiting list usually on the square feet, waiting list on views, so you're competing. My mother-in-law is ready to move, and she said, but I don't want to hurry. I'm like, there's no hurry because you'll be lucky to get what you want for a while. Okay, you got to plan in advance. Um, competing for... Um, not only where you might go and the things that you need and the things that you might want, and we recommend you prearrange and pre-book as many things as possible that you think in advance. If something happened to me and I went to the hospital and then I went to rehab, what rehab facility would I want to go to? And is it covered by my insurance? And you could call your person and they could tell you and you could make sure everybody knows I want to stay at the waterfront instead of some other place that's planned in advance. Because when you're told on a Friday you have to be out on Monday and you need a place to go, it's good that you already did your homework because you can't do any homework when you're in the hospital bed. All right, this silver tsunami is expected to peak by the year 2030. Extra credit, oh, I just answered the next one, okay. The silver tsunami, state sales, I'm told, might be gone in 10 to 15 years because there's too much stuff. Just think if we all got rid of all of our stuff at the same time, there's not enough people to buy it, especially as our country gets older and older. The older people are going to way, way, way outnumber the younger people. And so there's not people to buy the stuff. And the state sales might go away. Plus, the state sales are very hard to put on. And estate sale people don't always stay in the business. So time is of the essence sometimes when you're making these decisions. Um, okay, so I think we kind of covered that. Extra credit, what do you guys think? What is the social determinants of health concept? Okay, a theory that emphasizes how social factors, including social connections and relationships, impact overall health and well-being. All right, let's get a couple more sponsors up here, and let's discuss some of what we learned so far. But we do want to get to the blue sheet for some table discussion, and then they're going to really dig into those questions as well. Anybody else want to come up from home health or senior living or anything else? Thank you, Jamie. Okay. All right, what was something key that you heard so far in that pop quiz? Who here was a procrastinator when they were in school? Anybody procrastinate on assignments and not get stuff done on time? The first question she asked about the percentage of people who have a will 
brought that to mind, especially with the, the theme we have today, education and, and back to school. Uh, procrastination is uh, something that I think we all do when we get stressed out. And I think that estate planning is one of those things that uh, can easily overwhelm or stress a person out to the point where they say, I'll get it done next week. And in a situation with a will, that is not necessarily something that you can get done next week all the time. So it is procrastination in this context. Thank you, Jason. Uh, is something to be aware of. And those numbers kind of show that people do procrastinate on this uh, topic, estate planning and getting things in place uh, for further down the line. So that was one thing that popped into my mind, especially with the theme we have today. Sure, so as we talk about decluttering to increase your quality of life and just sort of free yourself of all of those items and those possessions that sometimes can be overwhelming um, and it may be difficult where to start, uh, I think of it in terms of the estate context. And Catherine's exactly right. The value of things are never what you think they are. I've had a handful of estates where there was some gem that nobody knew, you know, the sort of antiques roadshow style, you know, uh, finding where something is a, you know, a, a true Rembrandt or something. <laughs> That's rarely ever the case. And the other thing is, 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 you know, estate sales are great, but an estate sale happens at generally a location and the, your items are exposed to the people in the general area who are going to come to that estate sale. Now we have online estate sales and things like that, but you know, I find this with individuals who have a variety of different things. Maybe they have antique furniture, maybe they have a coin collection, maybe they have some firearms, maybe they have... Uh, I had an estate with a fishing lure collection that was insured for $250,000. I did not know that was a thing. I was, I was introduced to books and grade, grading books and, and, and price sheets and stuff. But it oftentimes requires, or sports memorabilia, and to, to realize the true value out of those things, you've got to get different types of professionals involved. You've got to send the, maybe it's real, maybe it's not, signed off somewhere. And you've got some furniture, and really to get an idea uh, of what that anti to somebody else and maybe the estate sale company doesn't deal with firearms and other sort of materials you know or uh, types of items and so a lot of things you know not only do they often not bring a lot of value but even the ones that do it takes a lot to get that it's not like it just turns into cash um, so oftentimes it requires time hiring different professionals a lot of coordination and you know this is being done by somebody who is maybe your child or your um, trusted friend who you appoint as your executor of your estate. And so they're dealing with a lot, administering estates, losing a friend or a parent. And this is a task that I seldom see people enjoy. Um, and, and the other thing, not to dominate the panel, but I wanted to mention one other thing is giving those things away. If you have you know, I occasionally have clients who have, you know, some people say, oh, just divide it among the kids how they agree. And then others, it's like everything from the linen closet to the garage, they've got a list of 150 items. They're, everything they own is inventoried and who they want it to go to. And that's not bad, you know, because that's clarity and we like that. But I often try to encourage them to think about giving those things away now. You know, you know, if the one, you're going to find out if the person really wanted it or not. <laughs> but you're, if they did, you're going to give them that, you're going to be able to realize that interaction. You're going to see them enjoy it. I mean, give a gift. Let them, you know, you know that exchange, that ceremony of, of doing that. Um, and you also make sure it gets to the person you want. You know, um, there are times when that doesn't happen even if that was your intention. You're not here. You're not here to do it anymore. And so there's, there's a lot of value in terms of not just your quality of life while you have this stuff all around you, but also ensuring that what you want to have done with those items happens and to alleviate uh, a burden for, for your children or whoever you have appointed to 
serve over your affairs. I fear God. Jamie, do people ever bring too much stuff to their beautiful two-bedroom or one-bedroom apartment? You know, it's funny because we actually, um, we are fully occupied. So when people come and tour, we're showing apartments that people live in. And when I have, I have two, two specific residents, they love it when I show their apartments. One has minimal things. Her apartment looks a lot bigger and more spacious, even though it's the exact same floor plan as another resident who has a lot of things. But she wanted to bring what she wanted to bring. And um, she doesn't have mobility issues, so that is something to keep in mind. Um, but it's just really interesting to show two different apartments that are set up completely different with the same floor plan. And Donette, our lead senior move manager is back there, and we've helped like 110 people move. And it really is something when people are so attached to their stuff and they just have stacks of things, it's just not as happy a place as it could be. And sometimes they're paying triple the rent because they need space for all their stacks. And you think, oh my gosh. And so we do the best we can to help people make good decisions. But it's good to do things while you're a little younger and fresher and thinking really well, get some of this stuff done. Because for a lot of people, they start thinking about this when they no longer are able to do things that they used to be able to do. And so getting it done first. And I love what you said, Jason, about give your stuff to your family members and friends now so you can see them enjoy it too. So not only are you making sure that they really do want it, and you're making sure that the right grandson got what you promised, that you get to see the look on their face and the enjoyment. Think how happy somebody like Randy Ambrose would have been to get a $250,000 collection of fishing lures. <laughs> he would have just lit up. And uh, so you could really, you know, have a great impact that way, and then you get the stuff out of your house. So think about that. We're already starting to do that in our home, except for Jillian's stuff. Better believe I'm going to now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We're going to take three minutes to have a discussion at your table about the blue paper or the Morris Lang paper. Pick one question to talk about at your table. Just for fun little activity, and then we're going to open up the mics for you. Jillian, if you'll come out with your mic, we want you to ask the questions. Ask any question that's on these sheets or anything that's in your mind, and we're going to get answers from the panel. Okay, let's begin. I've got a mic. Jill's got a mic. We want to know what you want to know. All right, we're going to come around. This is going to be like speed dating. Put these people to the test. Okay, Patricia. I have a retarded daughter that's about 35 now, and I need to find a place where she and I can go and have a two-bedroom apartment that would take my 35-year-old retarded daughter. Now, uh, Janae is uh, high-functioning, so that wouldn't be a problem of behavior and such, but still... They look at me and go, oh, why don't you just put her in a home? Well, in a home, she wouldn't be allowed to walk to Quick Trip or go to a movie unless it's a group thing. And they'd be very limited in her social life. But at home, we go and do church stuff. We just do all kinds of things. But I can't find uh, income where we can meet it for both of us. And there's 30 years between the two of us. Very good. And planning ahead, too, for whoever survives also is very important. And that's not uncommon, Patricia. There's a lot of people that have adult children that they care for. And so there needs to be a plan in place. I know adult Catholic uh, diocese, where are you? Okay, I know you're helping us with the family right now. Would you like to come on up? 
So we can help you solve those issues. Brian Spear on the board of directors, he and I help people figure out those kind of details. And so you just have to call our main number and we can help you. I would imagine that some of you might have some input as well. <laughs> that is a tough one to be able to stay within the, you know, meet the income is really where it, you're going to have a difficult time and then staying together. So, um, you know, in that case, if somebody had a long-term care policy, well, that would only work for the one person, the other person would be paying out of pocket to stay. So that, that is a very difficult situation mm -hmm. um, based on your scenario. Doesn't mean it's not able to be done. It's just definitely going to take some research on, yeah, on how it's going to mm -hmm. be accomplished. I yeah. don't blame you. Yep. Mm -hmm. Sure. So that senior living strategy, because most everyone has some complexities in their life. True or not true? True. And so coming to um, senior living strategy that Brian Spear is going to facilitate at PBS on October 10th, plus coming to senior expo at PBS, that's going to give you additional resources. I think working with an attorney is very important. So you want to put together the team of people that can help figure out what your challenges are. No matter what they are, there are people that know how to help or find the right people. And so Natalie is working on a real complex situation that's similar, that sometimes when seniors really need to move into independent living or assisted living, something has to be done about the adult child that they're caring for. And they've got solutions. So Natalie is a good resource. Natalie, did you have any thoughts on that? Oh, I'm sorry. Where did I get that? Oh, because oh, because that's the person. That's the person. <laughs> Tell that's them your okay. real name. It's Chrissy S. Casanova with Catholic Charities. Um, I'm in our marketing team, but help out at Adult Day Services with the intake process. Um, I got to follow in the footsteps of Colleen here, so it's been a pleasure to meet her. Um, so Adult Day Services has um, the ability to. We have a twofold. So you know, in this particular situation, um, we do have um, a program that is for adults um, 18 and up they're dealing with uh, intellectual and development disabilities um, but then we also have on the other side a program that's a social and recreational program for seniors 55 and up um, so it's one of those ideas of aging in place so, you know, let's say you are a caregiver in one of our awesome partners of the Oxford Villas, our Oxford Senior Living, and uh, you're being a caregiver and your spouse is dealing with, um, you know, those the early signs of Alzheimer's and dementia, but you're not ready to put them into a further um, assisted living or a further full-time senior living. You know, that's where um, a place like us can come in that you can have that opportunity to go and do your doctor's appointment and um, allow your spouse to go to a day program um, that um, engages them and has activities for them to do and then you're able to have your own socialization as well. So it's just an additional aging in place option that uh, we have here locally. So, And as soon as we start hearing the situation, we already have ideas that that would be too much to go into, but we, we've got ideas. Just wondering, are you talking about only Catholic people? Absolutely Catholic not. People? So, nope, nope. Thank you me. know, not even all of our staff are, are Catholic. So, it's not, it is just um, through a partnership with the Catholic Church. Um, and so, it is not that you are required to be Catholic um, or um, have what, any faith. Um, so, it is just, um, we are part of that organization. So. Great question. Okay, who else? We got one right here. I have a question about living wills. We were talking at the table about them, and I was of the opinion that when you had a living trust that you didn't have to go to probate. The gentleman sitting next to me said his attorney said, no, that didn't work. It still had to go to probate. 
Well, so the distinction, I, I, there's some caveats here. Occasionally with a living trust, you do have to go to probate. Um, so with every living trust that you have, you also have a will that goes along with it. We call it a pour over will. And that will is important in case there's assets that were not placed in your trust. So a trust only governs assets that are t retitled to the trust or made a beneficiary of a financial account or a bank account. And so occasionally, if, if something's outside of the trust and the title wasn't changed, then you actually have to probate that pour over will. Uh, the idea is to not have to, though. That is a backup. Um, oftentimes, we file and preserve those wills just in case something is, is later discovered. But the idea is the pour over will should never have to be used if the trust is properly funded. Now, a, and, a, and a will, though, does have to go through probate. A will, that's a, it's a common misconception that, well, I have this piece of paper, it's a will, it says I'm the executor, so I hereby decree myself the executor of my father's estate. That's not how it works. The will is really just a, 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 a legal document that affects the probate process. It basically changes it. We're able to put certain rules on as just individuals about how we want our probate process to work. And the will allows for that. There's some procedural things that you can make simpler with a will. Um, so the probate process is simpler. And then you can also do some of the more obvious things. If you don't want your property just to go to your heirs in equal share, but you want to modify that and control that somehow, you got to have a will to do that. Or, or a trust. A, tr a trust can do that as well. Um, if you want to appoint, if you want to designate who you want to be in charge, you have to have some instrument to do that, either a will or a trust. But a, a will does have to go through probate. The idea of a trust is it should not have to go through probate, but it still might. At least the trust never has to go through probate, but there may be assets left out that have to go through probate. But as long as you've got a pour over will with your uh, living trust, it, you're good. Right, right. Yep, that'll, that'll put things into the trust after, after your death. So do you see how he could talk all day about this and that wouldn't make anyone sitting in the room an expert i'm sorry because he has a lot of experience in addition to his law degree and everything else he's done all of these challenges are very complex and so the answer to everything really is that one answer that said it depends and it really requires you to talk to lots of professionals and get professional consult and direction because the answer is it depends so you just be curious and then go find the people that can help you figure things out. Just like last month, I know sometimes some of the people really wanted to know, well, I need to know exactly where to invest my money. You're not going to learn it in a 90-minute seminar. The whole point of the seminar is one thing. Find your people. Build your team. Know what organizations are out there. Know what people are out there that you can count on. How detailed should you be in writing items down in the trust? Uh, and also, what happens to those things that you do not write down in the trust? The other things that you have, what happens to them? Sure. So um, it depends. When I, I think about estate planning and I talk about it and visit with my clients about it, you know, I like to think of the who, what, when, where. You know, when we talk about, you know, what is your situation? What, what do you need in, in terms of making sure that your goals and objectives are met? So I say who. Who's in your family? What, you know, what are your kids like? Do they get along? Do they not? Do, you know, have they been eyeballing your stuff for years saying, I want that? Or do they say, burn it all down? You know, uh, who, who is it? You know, and then what? What kind of stuff do you have? You know, are you the, you know, maybe the person that just has regular stuff in your house and you don't 
you know, collect art or have these other things that, you know, are functional items? Or do you have a lot of heirlooms, collectibles, those sorts of things? Um, it's, it's when, when, when do you want people to have them? You know, when do you want? Do you want to distribute at your death during, after, while you're alive, sometime after your death? Um, and then where? You know, where are these items located? You know, are there things in a safe deposit box? Do you have maybe a lake house or something off somewhere else where there's stuff there? You know, where are these things located? All those things are going to uh, be factors in how specific you need to be. So to answer your direct question, how specific should you be? It depends. But here's, here's some good thoughts is if there are things you know you want certain people to have, name those. Um, identify it. That's the best way to ensure that they're going to get those items. With respect to the rest of the items, we refer to those as residue. And so those are usually going to be divided in some sort of formula. It may be that if you have children, divide them as my children agree. I would write, you know, that you've got to, you've got to take into account that first W, who? Who are we dealing with? Is that something that's going to work? And then other times, it may be a third party who, who oversees some division process. But you know, tangible personal property and stuff can be very challenging because it's difficult to divide. People have, you know, if you have a bank account with $60,000 and three kids and it's going to be divided equally, people aren't going to be fighting over which dollars they get. You know, they're not, I want that dollar, I want that dollar. This dollar means more to me. It, it's all fungible, it all mean, it's all the same. Tangible personal property and stuff is just so unique and the people involved are unique as well. And so their approach to those things are going to be very different. So really, I guess it goes back to sitting down, really thinking about what your situation is like what your kids, if it's kids that you'd be leaving property to or grandkids, are like, and then think about how does this play out. Imagine you're not here and imagine this is sort of dumped on them to, to, to handle. Do they need a lot of guidance? Do you need specifics? If so, put it in there. Or if you have two or three kids that get along great, great relationships, Leave it, to get, leave it to them. Delegate it to them. You guys get along. And it could be a very therapeutic and enjoyable time for some families to go through those things. You know. Can we, after we list things, can we just say the rest of the it, are, it could be divided among the, Absolutely. the family members? Absolutely. Yep. Yep. And, yep. and, that's, it, and, that? that's, and that's the difference between a, what we call a specific bequest and then residuary bequests. And so sometimes people think, well, the residue, that seems like a small amount. Well, the residue is ev anything that's not specifically earmarked. So oftentimes a, a person's will is set up purely as residue. All my items I want divided between my three, three kids in equal shares. Mm -hmm. You know, everything's right. Nothing, there's no specific amount, dollar amount that's going to somebody or some specific item. So do you see this back and forth here? That's what you want to have is sit down face to face with the different people that you can have these back and forth conversations so you can really figure out your own situation. What would you think about having a session that's just 100% on law? We could do that here. Or if you gentlemen, either at Feast and Brewing or at Morris Lane, would ever put on workshops that we can invite people to where we can dig deeper just on that. That you can dig deeper anytime just by reaching out to Jason at Feast and Brewing or Ben at Morris Lang, they're people you know now. Do you feel like you know them a little bit? And they seem pretty nice and knowledgeable. So those are people that you can call. And if you run very fast after class, you might be able to catch them and set that up or ask them something else. All right, who's got I a different more. question? We've got a couple questions back to back. Here you go. My question is about the trust and the will. Is there a, a ironclad way to set up a trust and estate to be sure that you are able to avoid probate? For 99%. Not ironclad because there's these odd situations where somebody passes away and they realize, well, they're, they're 
cousin or uncle passed away six months before they did, and you're actually a heir of theirs and a beneficiary of the estate or something, and so that that item could never have got put into your trust. So sometimes people receive property or don't even realize there may be an heir. Maybe Uncle Charles's estate was never probated 10 years ago, and it's discovered when they try to sell it. Well, they can't sell it. It's got to go through probate, and you happen to be a 112th interest you know, in that. So there are odd situations that could pop up, for, but by and large, you can set them up and make sure they're all properly funded, all accounts um, are, are retitled to the trust or made a beneficiary of that account, uh, real estate is retitled, vehicles are titled, and then we do general assignments to the trust, a written instrument, because there's a lot of stuff. How do you assign your dining room table to the trust? There's no. There's no certificate of title, there's no piece of paper. So the law allows you to do a general assignment that all of my property, and even put going on in the future, a property I acquire, I am going to acquire it in my capacity as trustee of my trust. And so there, there are ways to make it all but ironclad. I would say like copper cladded. Does anybody have one last burning question and then we're going to open it up and then you can go visit with the sponsors? Glenda. 12 and 13. What the heck is AEP and when does it start and stop? And what is OEP and when does it start and stop? So that could be its own workshop and you're going to start having workshops at American Senior Benefits in your new building on the east side because all of those questions have to do with your Medicare and your insurance. So OEP and AEP, those are two different enrollment periods that um, the government gives to seniors or people that are Medicare to change things. AEP stands for annual election period, or you hear it annual enrollment period. It starts October 15th, and it goes through December the 7th. The reason that one is so important is because if you're on original Medicare with a Part D, you need to review your Part D. If you're on a Part C, which is Medicare Advantage, you need to review your Medicare Advantage. I have people all the time that say, well, my medications are the same as they were last year. I don't really need a review. It's not your medicines that are the problem. It's the plan changed how it covers it. So what was one a tier one one year might be a tier three the next year. Then you're gonna go into the donut hole or you're gonna have to change your medication. OEP comes after AEP and it stands for open enrollment period. That is a second enrollment period. So the people that did not do their per, uh, part C um, reviews, you get to do it from January 1st through March 31st. Now, if you are a Part D person, you only get October 15th through December the 7th. The second enrollment period is for Part C. Holy cow. Everybody's job is so complicated. And that means your life is complicated because you got to figure all this out. And so that's why we have Empowered Senior, and that's why we're so appreciative of you guys being here. So next month, we're going to dig deeper into senior living and aging well. In October, we're talking fire safety and emergency safety.